Okay, so um, I have a disclaimer here, which is that unfortunately I own no stock in any of the companies that make these drugs. Uh, too bad. Uh, my second is that I have a bias. I've been doing this for over 30 years, and I like to practice common sense medicine. I definitely believe the art of medicine has been overshadowed by, by uh, evidence-based medicine, as in some people can't do anything if they don't have an article to tell them how to do it. Uh, and I believe a fraction of the medical literature actually has relevance to clinical practice. Therefore, I will not be quoting statistics, but I'm going to pre present to you my distillation of the thoughts after reviewing the alleged side effects as well as my years of experience. I was around when Prilosec came on the market, which was about 1990, and when the uh, drug detailers came in, they said, oh, this is a great drug, one pill a day, shuts down acid 100%, 36 hours, which, as it turns out, is not really true, and probably good that it's not true when we come to talk about some of these side effects, because most of the side effects are thought to occur as a result of inadequate acid to absorb one or more nutrients. All right, so these are the reported side effects. I'm sure you've heard of most of them, uh, including uh, bone fractures, alteration in bone metabolism, an increased risk of C. diff, even if a patient hasn't been on an antibiotic, chronic kidney disease, dementia, and most recently, death. Uh, there was the interaction with omeprazole and Plavix some time ago that became the hot topic, and hypomagnesemia. I'm going to talk about all of these, but I'll mention the omeprazole and Plavix as an example of why I think the medical literature is often flawed. Uh, this was based on the fact that omeprazole cranks up the liver enzymes that metabolize Plavix. People weren't dropping dead from heart attacks or strokes, that their Plavix wasn't working. It was simply somebody out there who's an academician deciding, gee, this could be a bad side effect. Then it goes to the lay literature and the media, and suddenly everybody who's on omeprazole stops their omeprazole, and everybody worries. And in the end, there's no proof of that, and I think people have gotten away from being concerned about it. But there's plenty of other choices to choose from, so if you want to err on the side of not having a problem, you can do that. Um, most of these side effects are based on retrospective or population-based studies, and they represent associations, not causation. And in most cases, the mechanism of causation, if indeed it was present, has not been elucidated. I'm going to give you the take-home messages up front. As you all know, patients are asking every day, as John said, I probably spend an hour a day with several different patients doing my little spiel. And for much of the last few years that this has been a, a concern, I have pretty much told them I think it's all nonsense. Uh, and I took on this talk actually to see if I could convince myself otherwise and maybe learn something, and I haven't been convinced otherwise. So bottom line is, though, it's out there. Uh, you know, uh, I learned from Lester Holt last summer that these drugs cause dementia, and patients don't have the knowledge or ability to sort through the literature, and they're going to take that to heart. So it doesn't matter what I think, it doesn't matter what you think, it doesn't matter what the medical literature really says, it's what the patients are concerned about, and they are indeed concerned. Going back to common sense medicine, should any patient be on any medicine if they don't really need it? The problem is, is that many patients have been on these medicines for years, they don't remember why they were put on them, uh, they haven't tried coming off of them. You know, I'll often see a patient come in uh, to schedule their colonoscopy and I'll notice they're on Nexium and I'll say, how long have you been on Nexium? Ever since it came out, well that was the year 2000. Uh, and, you know, I said, do you, you know, are you taking it for reflux? You know, I don't really know. I just got started on it, and I've always stayed on it. And if I miss it a day, I have heartburn. You know, it may be reasonable, but, uh, you know, people wind up on them for a long, long time. So, simple recommendation is review with them why they're on it. Uh, if they don't know or, you know, say, why don't you try stopping and see what happens, there may be some validity to, say, uh, reducing the dose or going to every other day for a couple weeks and then stopping because of some uh, rebound hyperacidity, um, try going to a less potent acid blocker like ranitidine, uh, and again, yeah, if they don't know why they're on it, can't, can't really hurt in most instances to stop it. But these are conditions which may merit long-term use and where they should not be stopped. One of those is Barrett's esophagus. Uh, as recently as this past weekend, I was at the American College of Gastroenterology meeting in, in Orlando. Nobody's ever proven that staying on a proton pump inhibitor would uh, prevent the progression from Barrett's to cancer, but it kind of makes common sense. I like to tell my patients about Barrett's that it's kind of the body's way of saying if there's acid washing up here all the time, let's put up a lining that tolerates acid. And unfortunately, that's a good thing, but what's a bad thing is it gives you an added risk of turning into cancer. And, and a point on that, remember, once patients have Barrett's esophagus, often their reflux symptoms will go away. 
So they may say, Doc, why do you want me to be on this? I don't have any heartburn anymore. I don't have any problems. Uh, and that's because they no longer have an acid-sensitive mucosa. And clearly, people can go on to develop cancer in that setting. So probably should keep patients on these drugs for that reason, or at least give your thought that that's what should happen. Uh, recurrent esophageal stricture, which we don't see that much of anymore. Most of the time when people have things, they have a shot ski ring. Um, but back when I was in training, uh, you know, I was part of my training was at the VA in DC. We'd have patients come in who didn't get sedated. They just got topical xylocaine. They'd sit in a chair and you'd pass three Maloney dilators. Uh, and that was when Tagamet was the only thing we had. Once we got better, you just don't see that much anymore. Uh, but we see lots of people come into the emergency room with meat stuck in their esophagus, usually around 11 o'clock as my head is hitting the pillow, after they've been in the ER for two or three hours. Uh, and many of them have eosinophilic esophagitis, which is a whole other topic. But for whatever reason, people that have this tend to get things caught. I don't know if it's because they have like a sandpaper esophagus or what. They don't necessarily have strictures, so they can have significant strictures in webs. I don't know that the literature says those people should be kept on this, but I can tell you for my own benefit of sleeping, my patients will be. Um, and then again, uh, patients who have to be on non-steroidals who are at high risk, and those are people over 70, probably women more than men, definitely smokers, probably alcohol. People who have had a prior major bleed uh, are people who should probably be on one of these drugs to prevent ulceration and especially if they are on a medicine such as Coumadin or Warfarin that would be catastrophic if they do develop a bleed. So now for the specifics. Uh, uh, the effects on bone metabolism came out of a study out of Denmark about 10 years ago or so, uh, and basically they looked at everybody who was coming into the hospital with hip fractures who were over 65 years of age, compared them to a group of people who came in for other reasons, did a retrospective analysis of medications that had been used, because it's a socialized medicine country and they have that data, and they came up with that if you took omeprazole twice a day for more than a certain amount of time, let's say two years, you seem to have an added risk. Again, an association, not a causation. Now, this is where you get into, does do these drugs really block acid 100% for 36 hours, as the drug detailer told me years ago? because the proposed mechanism is decreased calcium malabsorption, which requires acid. Uh, there may be a secondary fact where there is decreased activation of osteoclast, and bone mineral density studies may not uh, correspond to the concern. So doing that isn't necessarily going to tell you whether you're doing the right thing or not. Um, the thing about... Uh, um, the acid absorption is that B12 and iron also require acid absorption, and we don't have an epidemic of B12 and iron deficiency. Uh, you know, one of the things I remember learning, true or not, was that if you quit absorbing B12, you potentially have a store of B12 that lasts you four years in your liver before you become depleted. So this isn't something that happens overnight, for sure, um, unless they have other reasons for not absorbing it. Subsequent studies have shown that you probably don't have an added risk unless you have at least one other risk factor, and the two major risk factors would either be smoking or postmenopausal women, or even worse, the combination of both of those, which is certainly still out there. Uh, again, I don't believe this in part because those things aren't malabsorbed, and I also don't believe it because you all know that the pharmaceutical companies, the, the uh, pharmacists, tell our patients that you should take these drugs 30 to 60 minutes before eating in the morning. Now, it's not because it hurts to take on an empty stomach or during the meal. It's because the whole idea is get it into your system, then eat. Eating recruiting as many of these pumps to come to the surface, and you hit them while they're up, hoping that that one dose will last to the next day. Okay, But in many people it doesn't, which is why some people are on twice daily proton pump inhibitors. Because when the drug is no longer in your bloodstream, new pumps are made. There's nothing there to block them. So that at 12, 16 hours and beyond, you start making acid again. Hence, probably by the time you eat your evening meal with your steak that contains iron, you're still going to absorb it. Uh, I will say on this subject that the, the official recommendations say that you do not need to do or should do bone densitometry prior to starting or at any point along the way. Some of my more paranoid patients who I have circular conversations with for 25 minutes uh, where they're intensely concerned or I think litigious. I have done this. 
uh, you know, I, I don't think it's unreasonable. And certainly you should be doing it on people who are appropriate to be doing it on, which are women, essentially, and, and under over a certain age. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily correspond. Uh, then there is C. diff. Now the proposed mechanism here is increased colonization due to absence of acid. This probably has some validity. This little thing over here. Uh, it probably has some validity in some settings. So for example, you get an elderly patient from a nursing home, close quarters to start with, greater likelihood of being colonized to start with. They get admitted to the hospital for pneumonia. They get put on an antibiotic. They're given an IV proton pump inhibitor because why? They were on something when they came in or because who knows why, but they get put on it. I can believe that those people probably have an added risk. Um, anyway, I can go on about that, but, uh, but again, it is thought that this can occur even in people who haven't been on antibiotics. Maybe this There we go. Uh, okay, I, I told you you could stop me when I was talking too much, but I, I thought you'd figure out a better way to do that than this. Anyway, uh, so I don't think I've ever seen a patient who has gotten C. diff, who hasn't been on antibiotics and has been on a proton pump inhibitor. But maybe I really haven't looked that hard. Occasionally you'll see somebody who didn't take care of mom, who hasn't been in a hospital or a nursing home, who didn't get antibiotics, but it's not very frequent. If you do see somebody like that, I guess you should think about this. The recommendations are that if you do have a patient with C. diff, you should stop the proton pump inhibitor uh, because it definitely increases the risk of recurrence. On the other hand, your average outpatient who needs to go on an antibiotic who's on these medicines does not need to have it stopped. Uh, there was a flurry, I don't know, five, seven years ago, maybe even longer than that, of concern about um, uh, outpatient acquired pneumonia. And again, the idea is decreased uh, acid permits colonization of, of the upper respiratory tract. It was observational. Uh, there was finally this study down below that uh, looked at patients just starting NSAIDs and who were going to give get prophylactic uh, PPI or H2 blocker, and with neither case was there increased admission for pneumonia at six months. So that's kind of died down, I think. Uh, hypomagnesemia, again, the thought is reduced intestinal absorption. Uh, it's most likely to occur in a patient uh, who's been on these medications greater than a year. Uh, the FDA does actually suggest that you get a baseline magnesium level who are in patients who are likely to be on it long term, not just somebody you're going to give it to for 30 days or two months or whatever. Uh, and it says periodically. It doesn't say what periodically is, but I would think maybe every six months or so it would be reasonable to do a magnesium level. Um, kidney disease. Again, it doesn't, you know, your average layperson isn't going to know what that means. They're going to think, oh, you're on dialysis, okay? It can rarely cause acute interstitial nephritis, but the more common uh, concern, which is really just a decrease in the GFR, comes from this study that's listed there, the atherosclerosis risk and community study, where they had data that they retrospectively analyzed and came up with that if you know, all these people started with a GFR greater than 60, they followed them for 13.9 years, and again, there was an association with an increased risk of developing in GFR less than 60. And twice daily was worse than once daily, which was worse than H2 blockers. Now, dementia, this just came out, uh, I guess, in 2015. As I mentioned, I learned about it from Lester Holt on the NBC Nightly News as I was getting undressed uh, last July, I think, after I came from work. Um, and it is based on insurance claims data in, in, and shows a statistical association of dementia and long-term PPI use. And interestingly, it only occurred in women. Going back to how, how are these things related? I mean, in what way would you get dementia from being on these drugs? Is it malabsorption of some brain nutrient like selenium or chromium or something else we don't even know that we're absorbing? Uh, but why women and not men? You know, that, that doesn't seem right. Usually it's the other way around that men seem to have dementia more than women because they lead more abusive lifestyles. Uh, so, most recently we have death. This has just come out in August. It's a VA study where they followed people for a median of 5.7 years. They were all new PPI users. And the death rate uh, of PPI versus H2 was 4.5 versus 3.3 per 100 person years. 
supposedly, you know, uh, comorbidities were adjusted and so on and so forth, but let's face it, the VA population is not the healthiest population out there. Uh, so I think it's really hard to say why the drug, again, would lead to death. Uh, it is duration-related, however. Uh, the hazard ratios, as you can see, for 30, less than 30 days are one, and they go up increasingly out to 720 uh, days. And again, what's the mechanism? So whether I believe these things or not, whether you believe them or not, uh, the public has heard about them, and as I said, the lawyers can't be far behind. I actually Googled lawsuits, PPIs, and there are a rash of guys out there looking for patients. Most of them were in reference to the kidney concern. Uh, so uh, I tell patients that the alleged, in fact, I don't know if any of you I actually get patients from or send letters to, but I always tell about how I tell them it's probably not true, and I like the word alleged. You know, the news media loves that even after somebody has a video of murdering someone, they're an alleged criminal. These are alleged side effects, uh, and the side effects are based on retrospective studies, not ongoing studies. And I'm going to talk to you, and I left some handouts up back there. One is for you guys, one is to give to patients so you can maybe not have to spend as much time talking to them. You can edit it as you see fit. But I tell them, you know, look, it's not as though somebody took a group of 50-year-olds who are going to be on these medicines for the next 15 years and followed them for all these side effects to see whether they really happened or didn't happen. It's all retrospective, and I think they can kind of understand that concept. What I put on that sheet for the patients is, suppose I decided I was going to do a study where I took men, oh, let's say between the age of 40 and 50 who are bald and compared them to men who were, had hair. And I did a survey to see whether they had used these medicines over the last 10 years from 30 onwards. And somehow, if there was an increased usage, I would conclude that PPI is called bald, cause baldness. And that might even have some real basis. Think about it. You know, maybe, maybe again, you're not absorbing selenium or something like that, that the hair follicle needs. But of course, it totally ignores that male pattern baldness is genetic, right? So I think that's a good analogy. And that's in my little piece of paper to give to them that I think they can understand what we're talking about. What do you tell the patients? Well, first of all, it's reasonable, going back to common sense, to review with them why they're on the medicines in the first place. In many cases, it's been for a long, long time, and they may not remember. You may not have been the prescriber. Uh, and again, you can suggest tapering, tapering the lowest possible dose or discontinuing or switching to an H2 blocker. If you're going to do an H2 blocker, though, it's important to recognize that if you're going to get anywhere close to the efficacy, you have to get at least the standard dose of 150 milligrams twice daily. And a little known fact, because nobody cares anymore, is that when Prilosec came out and the Zantac people were, of course, going to lose all sorts of money, they actually got FDA approval to be given 150 milligrams four times a day for erosive esophagitis. I took advantage of that at that time because the insurance companies didn't want to pay for Prilosec. I said, well, that's fine. I'll give Renitidine four times a day, which was still a brand, and you'll spend just as much money. And it is FDA approved for that. So, for people who really have documented severe erosive esophagitis, you can be on that up to four times a day. Whether at that point you're causing the same problem you are with the proton pump inhibitor in terms of uh, uh, no acid is another question. There are definitely some conditions not to stop. Again, Barrett's esophagus, severe peptic stricture, or erosive esophagitis. Note that often we'll get consults in the hospital for primarily elderly women from nursing homes who have had coffee grounds emesis and you wind up doing their procedure and they have severe erosive esophagitis because the kyphosis often is associated with a large hiatal hernia. Many of these patients are recumbent and they should definitely be on a proton pump inhibitor. And many a time, I've written in the chart, are told the relative, they need to be on this medicine forever. Nursing homes, if they're paying the bill, you, you, know, you pay them one money and they divvy out the meds and they pay for them, they're going to try to get a cheaper alternative. These patients should not be on an H2 blocker. They need to be on a proton pump inhibitor. Uh, history, again, of complicated peptic ulcer disease, and I put recent times because patients will say, you know, I have an ulcer. I said, oh, when was that diagnosed? Well, back when I was pregnant with Billy, around 1969, I think I had an ulcer. Well, how was it diagnosed? Oh, no, the doctor just told me I had it because it sounded like it. Okay, so those don't count. But people who in recent era have been diagnosed officially, and especially if they've had a major bleed, and again, if their bleed may be catastrophic, if they're on blood thinners, et cetera, uh, probably not a good idea to stop them. And again, that includes people in um, NSAIDs. Again, I don't think anybody has said this, but I'm saying it. I probably would keep my eosinophilic esophagitis patients on it. 
Then we can talk about lifestyle modifications, because we all want to be holistic. I know I do. Uh, and what I wrote here is all your patients would be skinny, not smoke, and work out three times a week if this was a sufficient answer to the dilemma. I mean, the American populace would much rather take one pill a day and eat, drink, and do whatever else they want to do. Uh, but you can tell them these things, you know, white containing, uh, acid containing food, red wine, spirits, chocolate, coffee, don't lay down within two hours after eating. Bottom line is, you know, they'll say, well, what can I eat? Well, I'm not you, okay? I have reflux and ice cream causes a problem. Who would think that? Uh, so, you know, they gotta, they gotta do it themselves. You know, if it bothers you, don't eat it. It just makes common sense. One other point about reflux is, you know, it's not all acid. Often these patients will be on these medicines. I have a patient I saw, an elderly man this week, who's on protonics in the morning, protonics before dinner, and H2 blocker at bedtime. Now, I don't know exactly what that's treating, but I'm pretty sure it's over-treating. And the problem is, all you're doing when you give these drugs is taking the acid out of the refluxant, if you will, which may alleviate your heartburn symptoms because it makes what you're refluxing less noxious to the esophageal mucosa. But that's not enough. And as John talked about, we don't have a lot of good pro-motility drugs. You know, the only one that we really have that has been used as a, uh, a co-agent in treating reflux in times gone by is Reglan. And I don't think very many people want to use that these days unless you've got a really good reason. I do, but probably not for my average reflux patient. So, you know, those are patients who, if they're not managed with that kind of management, then you either want to do a pH study, which is an endoscopy where you implant a little capsule in the bottom of the esophagus and they wear a monitor for 48 hours. I do them off of therapy because I want to see if they really have reflux. And I do that especially if the patient's being sent from ENT or pulmonary looking at some atypical symptom and they're on twice daily proton pump inhibitor and they're not better. It either means the diagnosis is wrong or they got it really bad. Or in a certain, you know, certain circumstances, that's a patient that consider a fundoplication. Certainly, if you have a 30-year-old who has documented erosive esophagitis, uh, that heals, but they still have symptoms, you know, you're basically telling them you're going to be on this the rest of your life, presuming they don't smoke, presuming they're not overweight, which are really the only two risk factors to get rid of, and those are appropriate candidates for pH monitoring. When I brought up about talking about this subject, one of my younger partners said, he really thinks that you should probably have to have a pH monitor study for anybody you're going to keep on it long term from a medical legal standpoint. I think that's taking it a little far, but clearly people who aren't better uh, with these kind of doses, you need to question what you're really treating. So uh, again, to conclude, you're going to review the indications for it, use for short duration at least dose, attempt switching to an H2 or stopping altogether. Uh, reassure the patients that most of these alleged side effects are association, not causation. And if the patient can be weaned, consider referral for pH study to verify the necessity of continuing the drug. Uh, again, I left sheets back there um, that I hope you'll take because I think it'll save you a lot of hassle at the office. Uh, you'll know what can, one is, again, a summary for you of what I just talked about. The other one is to hand out to patients there on the round table near that screen in back. That's it. <laughs>